Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to uh, the rest of the day. I'm going to switch gears a little bit in, uh, in talking with Thry. I want to talk a little bit more about the role of culture and context as we're on this kind of road to medical education transformation. So here's the outline um, for my talk. I'm going to talk a little bit and kind of revisit a competency-based education model and system outcomes. That's come up several times over the last two days. And then just bear, uh, share a little bit around the importance of having um, shared mental models around what do we mean by competency-based training and why is that so important, I think, globally. And again, we've alluded to that. And then I'll give you a, a kind of case study on the importance of culture around a competency. In this case, we'll examine some literature around professionalism. So um, we've seen several diagrams from this article by Julio Frank and colleagues. Uh, Victor showed some of these yesterday. This is another from that article that I find particularly helpful that talks a little bit about, about our journey over the last century. At the top of that model really was what came out of the Flexner report. The importance of having a scientific curriculum generated by the experts. And that really drove a lot of medical education around a good bit of the world for a long time. And that curriculum was then attached to educational objectives. Uh, how many people, show of hands, had to write educational objectives for your courses? How many people actually used them, right? They often kind of sad, they weren't necessarily operationalized. And then they may or may not be attached to assessment and they tended to be pretty modest with regards to assessment. And the last century was dominated really mostly by testing, you know, for kind of the summative judgments. There were clearly evaluations by faculty, but testing was a big driver. What Frank and what we've been talking about the last two days is that what we really need to do is start with the health and healthcare needs where we work. Our regions, you just heard some nice examples happening in Qatar around the shifting uh, you know, demographics and the uh, associated implications around disease burden. And so that's the big driver. And the competencies and outcomes should really flow from that. And they're going to vary a bit depending on our locale. And all of this is going to be situated within context and culture. This plays a big role. It's not that they're separate. And the curriculum and assessment are drivers of that, but they're really the last things we ought to work on. This is not a new concept. It's interesting to note that the World Health Organization actually sponsored a white paper back in 1978, and you could see that this comes out of the preface. The intended output of a competency-based program is a health professional who can practice medicine at a defined level of proficiency in accord with local conditions to meet local needs. Uh, the first author in that was a gentleman by the name of Bill McGahey, who's actually currently at Northwestern, but some of you may also uh, notice the George Miller, uh, the famous Miller Assessment Pyramid was also part of that report. So one of the challenges we've had over the ensuing decades, and really over the last 15 years as competency frameworks begin to take hold, is that we really have a shared mental model. What do we mean by competency-based training, and what does it look like across the globe? So these are just three examples of competency frameworks, the CANMEDS, which I believe is used in the Netherlands, or the ACGME, which is used um, obviously in the United States, but also in Qatar, Middle East, and Singapore, and then you have the good medical practice uh, that comes out of the UK. And you'll notice that although the words are a little different, there's a fair amount of overlap. Um, and that's actually reassuring that we have a fair amount of understanding about what it really takes to be an effective physician, regardless of where you are, even if they're described a bit differently. We also heard the importance of kind of principles yesterday. And so a nice quote uh, from Nuno, from uh, Jimmy Carter, about you know, unchanging principles. And so I thought it'd be interesting to kind of reflect on what are the fundamental principles that underlie competency-based system. The first is graduate outcomes in the form of achievement of predefined pre desired competencies is the goal. And we just saw that in the nice Julio Frank diagram. Competencies are derived from the needs of patients organized into these frameworks, these competency frameworks. Here's one I think we're really struggling with, and we struggle more with it than any other country in the United States, time. Time is actually a resource for learning. It's not the basis of progression. We tend to treat uh, time as if it's an intervention. I think that's a mistake. Uh, we have to use our time wisely. It's not that you don't need a certain amount of time. Ola Tenkat wrote a very nice article about this false dichotomy we've set up around time. Of course you need experience, 
but how we use time, I think we have to really take seriously. Teaching and learning experiences are sequenced to facilitate an explicitly defined progression of ability and stages. And we've heard that as a common theme. Learning is tailored to the learner's individual progression in some manner. This is hard. Many of our learners in, in our systems have a lot of service responsibilities. And so how do you tailor something when they have those responsibilities, not only for patient care, but many times for teaching? You know, some of our most important teachers are our residents and our fellows and our senior house officers. How does that fit if we're going to tailor their own learning? Numerous direct observations and focused feedback contribute to effective learner development of expertise. This is, I think, part of the past we need to bring back, and that's the bedside round. Most studies, at least in Western countries, show that patients really want you at the bedside, that when we sit outside the hall and talk about them, they can hear us, and they don't like it. They want to be part of the conversation. Again, that's very culturally bound, but it's something for us to think about. Why don't we bring that part back? And it was nice to hear in the last talk that you had direct observation procedures and many clinical evaluation exercises was in that. And then finally, assessment, building again on what Nuno said, is really an important part of this. It needs to be planned, systematic, systemic, across the entire program, and integrative. Something that's very important. So what I'd like to do actually is give you a couple minutes at your tables to make this a little bit more interactive. Um, just spend two minutes and talk about where do you think your training systems are right now with regard to these fundamental principles in composite based medical education. Where are you on the journey? So spend just two quick minutes talking with your colleagues at your table about where you think you are in your country and in your system, okay? So as we move forward and, and we think a little bit about these principles and kind of where you think you are in your own journey, some of these are pretty challenging in some of the systems we currently have. Also want to switch gears a little bit to think about kind of where we've also been. And I think this also came up yesterday. <laughs> I'm glad the conversations are going good. Um, one of the challenges I think we've had is that we've tended to uh, see educational outcomes and clinical outcome, outcomes somewhat separate. You know, we have the patients over here, we, we put our learners into the clinical microsystem, they see patients, and then we come out over here and we quote, do education. I think that's been unfortunate. And the learner and patient are kind of the intersection there, but we see these worlds as different. Uh, and this is from an article that um, I had the good fortune to do with Brian Wong recently. And I think we have to kind of change this paradigm. And what are the kind of implications of that? Well, one is I think we have to think more in terms of this concept of co-production. This is a nice uh, article on the BMJ Quality and Safety by Marm Batalden, talking about co-production from a patient care perspective. That patients are our partners in order to really realize the promise of patient-centered care. We have to co-produce and co-create health with our patients. And so we have our patients and our professionals engaged in kind of co-execution of the care. They plan together what makes sense for patients. This is particularly important in patients with multiple chronic disease because there are trade-offs. They don't take many, multiplication, uh, many medications. They have to really be activated to care for themselves and manage their conditions. And we're seeing a lot of technology. We heard a little bit about yesterday, I'm sure more this afternoon, about how important technology is now beginning to play in that kind of co-execution of care. And obviously, this needs to be founded and grounded in, in really civil discourse. And if you think about that, that's all embedded within a context. It's the community and society, what's important to them, and it's the healthcare system. We just heard a little bit about the Hamad healthcare system, and all that is part of the context in which this occurs. Now, we can think about professionals in this and basically replace it with learners. I think education is also a co-production process, and it's very important that we co-produce in these different contexts to produce high-quality learning that not only leads to good learning, but then brings together the importance of the clinical and educa uh, educational outcomes. The patient really should always be at the center of what we do. And there is growing evidence that the clinical outcomes our trainees experience has a significant impact on how they turn out as physicians. That we can't just assume that if we give them a lecture over here and put them in a sim lab, no matter what they're experiencing in the clinical environment, they'll be okay. Turns out that what they actually deliver matters and probably matters a lot. And so really grounding this with our primary frame of reference being the patient, I think is the right way to go. And then we basically interact around this particular and dynamic um, relationship. So 
I also think this requires a rethinking of program evaluation, and this is where I think context and culture really also plays an important role. And Barbara alluded to this yesterday when she was talking about how they're evaluating interprofessional education, that they're not thinking in terms of randomized controlled trials, but instead using comparative effective approaches that really embrace the importance of context and complexity. One of the um, you know, models that's often used to evaluate programs is the Kirkpatrick framework uh, with this kind of four levels. There's been modifications of that. Um, this is a nice adaptation of Kirkpatrick in the context of healthcare that actually comes out of the National Health Service from a couple years ago. And what we're trying to accomplish is changes in professional practice through our training programs. And as we just heard, even in retraining and through CPD programs. And competencies serve as the framework to guide us. The patient outcomes we hope are linked, as I just said, we want those two things joined together. And for us in the United States, as Victor alluded to yesterday, the triple aim is one of our kind of uh, guiding forces. How do we operationalize the competencies? Well, we increasingly are using things like milestones, which we're currently using in the States and several other countries, and also EPAs and trustful professional activities, which were in fact developed in Holland um, by Ola Tenkant and others. But all this occurs within context. Right? And so and the patient outcomes and the changes are particularly context dependent. It's not that the lower parts of that triangle aren't either, but context plays a big role because depending on what the nature of the demographics are, who you're caring for, has a major effect on the kind of training that you need. I changed careers a fair amount because I was in the military. My colleague Rich Hawkins and I actually started um, together at Portsmouth. The patient population that took care of the military is very different than the one I took care of at Yale. Those contextual factors had a lot to do with what kind of professional development I engaged in because of the nature of who I was caring for. This is another framework I find particularly helpful. This comes from Ray Paulson McTilly, again from the UK. It's called the Realist Evaluation Framework. And what they basically ask is the following series of questions anytime they look at an intervention. What works, for whom, in what circumstances, and why? And in their model, an action is causal only if its outcome is triggered by a mechanism acting in context. Let me give an example of, of, I think, the importance of context. So many of you may be aware that there's a lot of interest in using checklists in particular situations. In this case, for central line associated bloodstream infections, there was a famous study by Peter Pronovos that showed that the use of a checklist in a series of hospitals in Michigan dramatically dropped the rate of infection. So the outcome, was a, the outcome was this reduction. And it actually showed up in a famous uh, book by Atul Gawande called The Checklist Manifesto, and everybody was pretty excited about it. And so the question is, what were the co-interventions that went with it? Well, this particularly became important because they tried to repeat this study in Canada and found no effect. And so it's a randomized controlled trial, like, okay, checklists don't work. The error in that was that when Peter Pronovos put his checklist into play, it was surrounded by a whole host of co-interventions. Faculty development, training the nurses, making sure there's buy-in from administration. All these co-interventions were critical to the success of this intervention. They did not happen in the Canadian study. And so it goes to show you that the co-interventions and the context, how things were operationalized, at both the micro, meso, and macro systems matter a lot. And thus, the reason you saw a difference, even in a randomized controlled trial, which we consider the gold standard. But in complexity models, RCTs are for not the best. If we think about it from an educational perspective, we often have these curricular interventions or we change assessments. Rich gave a bunch of wonderful examples just as it's happening at the medical schools. And the goal is to ultimately prepare an MD ready for unsupervised practice. But if you look at each of those interventions, whether it be a kind of practice EMR, or you're looking in IPE, they're surrounded by all kinds of co-interventions or different mechanisms that enable those things to be successfully implemented or operationalized. Faculty development's one of those, right? You can't put an assessment tool into the environment and not prepare people to use it. We know from the research, for example, that the greatest proportion of variance in assessment is actually due to the person who uses it. And the context, again, plays an important role. Buy-in, support, all those things are very important. This is just another example of the importance of context. This is a logic model that really walks through what it takes to implement a competency-based model. 
uh, it, we go through these various aspects. Context plays an important role in all these areas that I've just circled here and highlighted in red. External factors, how we do programmatic assessment. The needs assessment is highly influenced by context. And then finally, just to kind of close, let's take a look at just a case of where culture and context are particularly important. That's professionalism. Going back to our competency framework, you'll notice professionalism shows up in all three of these frameworks. So it's clearly been highlighted as something important. But that does it look the same depending on where you are? And the answer is it probably doesn't. This is a nice study from Brian Hodges looking at how professionalism is assessed as part of systematic review. He used something called discourse analysis. And you can see there were three broad themes. It's an individual level characteristic, behavior cognitive process, Professionalism is an interpersonal level effect between teacher, student, student to student, and student to patient. And professionalism is a socially determined phenomenon associated with power, institutions, and society. So something even as we think as straightforward as professionalism is deeply grounded in both cult, uh, culture and context. These were the things we found in that study that the assessment varied across historical and cultural context related to medicine's social responsibility and how that gets operationalized and viewed. And the recommendation that came out of that was that it really should be seen as a culture improvement. And that for professionalism, because of the various natures in the important context, formative methods should really predominate. The other thing that's really interesting in this study is that the literature, as um, determined by Brian and the group, was, quote, mostly Anglo-Saxon, interesting label and that cross-cultural caution and revalidation was needed. That you just simply can't apply these constructs across every culture because it's so grounded in a particular cultural view. And so a diversity of approaches is really important to take a look at this issue. They also made the, con uh, the, the important um, comment that professional behavior is a response to context. So you have to assess the context even when you're prof uh, assessing professionalism. That that has an important dynamic interplay with how we as professionals act. And so just looking at it as a characteristic or trait was incomplete. And then finally, just to really show how this has played out, this is a really nice article that was written um, by a group out of the UAE, taking a look at the professionalism construct and then looking at it from a quote, Western definition, and then quote, Arabian definition. These are their terms, by the way, which is interesting even to look at the labels that they chose. And they looked at uh, nine different dimensions and found that six of them overlapped actually quite well. But three did not. And you can see those three here in the slide. Again, highlighting the importance of context and culture, even in a competency like professionalism. That on the right-hand side there, professionalism was defined as a higher obligation beyond those just owed to patient society. That attributes must inform both professional and personal conduct and that primacy is placed in obligations towards safeguarding the rights of family, community, and system. And you can see a bit of the difference in some of the more westernized models, such as the physician charter in the United States. So just a nice example of where culture and context really plays out in something like a competency that we call professionalism. So let me stop there, and I hope that was a little helpful overview of the kind of role of culture and context, and I'll turn it back over to Thraya. <laughs>